Well, I have bread, but no water. Hold on, I'll get you some. Thanks, man. Man, if I eat bread without water, I'd choke and die. The year was 1998. Squaresoft had to build a reputation as the best makers of RPGs on consoles. Well, JRPGs at the very least. Their last big hit, Final Fantasy VII, came out on PlayStation the year prior and they were full force with more support for Sony's gaming machine. Turns out, their first foray in developing a game with graphics completely built on polygons wasn't going to be on a Final Fantasy game. In fact, we wouldn't see Final Fantasy fully embrace that until 2001's Final Fantasy X on PlayStation 2. That's right, Brave Fancy Musashi, this adventure RPG that doesn't get talked about enough was their first successful attempt at a fully 3D game. Stop! I know exactly what we're gonna say next. First fully 3D game? Ha! This guy clearly didn't do his research. Tobao number one and Ergaze both came out before Musashi. I'm disliking your video right now, idiot! To which I say... Wrong. Ergaze and Tobao number one were developed by Dream Factory, not Square. Ergaze is in the real Square soft game. It's an NEC arcade game that had a PlayStation version published by Square. Therefore, Musashi retains its importance in Square Enix history, which they must be somewhat aware of since they made a celebratory video six years ago. And yet, the game only got one re-release on PlayStation 3's PSN Classics catalog and only in Japan. The original concept involved the real Japanese legend himself, Musashi Miyamoto, and his rival Sasaki Kojiro. Musashi was meant to end up in an alternate world as an outsider, and it was meant to feature action game mechanics. The protagonist was changed to be loosely inspired by Miyamoto Musashi, keeping the Musashi name an ancient Japan swordsman motif, and the age significantly. A character based on Kojiro would also be in the final game, but his importance to the narrative is, um, almost nothing. Legendary Final Fantasy co-creator Hironobu Sakaguchi was the executive producer and didn't expect much from the game until he saw what his staff was cooking in the game's graphics and art style. We'll get to the graphics in its appropriate section. The game was mostly well received everywhere, its lowest critic rating being somewhere around the 7 out of 10 mark. For a new IP, it also sold pretty well in Japan, especially when you consider the gaming community was much smaller back then selling nearly 650,000 copies in its release year. It really is a mystery why for most of the world this game is still trapped in the 50th generation of consoles, unless you <clears throat> play it any way you can, so to speak. Stick around for my complete review of Brave Fencer Musashi on the Sony PlayStation and join me in becoming perpetually puzzled and frustrated with Screenix's inability to provide access to this game on modern platforms worldwide. Let's do it! A hundred and fifty years in the past of the Kingdom of Alucani, a hero known as Brave Fancy Musashi came and, using the Sword of Luminescence, Lumina, vanquished an evil threatening the kingdom, the Wizard of Darkness. Before disappearing, he left Lumina behind and became a widespread legend. When the game begins, the kingdom is under a new threat. The Third Squenchian Empire, which is after the Sword Lumina, uses the king and the queen's sudden absence to execute a surprise invasion. To defend the kingdom and not let the empire find the sword, the court asks the princess to perform a summon in hopes the legendary hero is brought into that role to save the kingdom once more. In a humorous and unfortunate twist, the hero they summon turns out to be a much younger and much ruder Musashi who has no idea where he is. He doesn't have any intention of helping originally, but since he can't go back to his world until he saves Alucanid, he has no choice but to play the hero role. He succeeds in retrieving Lumina from his resting place, but by the time he returns to the castle, the princess, Filet is kidnapped. After a big clash versus a giant steam robot built by the Empire, Musashi is told Lumina doesn't have its full power yet, and 35 members of the castle court were also kidnapped. To restore the sword to its full power, five elemental scrolls must be found and their respective quest guardians defeated. In the meanwhile, the Empire continues to plot to find ways to destroy Musashi and get their hands on Lumina. 
This puts the local village in frequent danger, making Musashi's quest involve more than just searching around for the legendary crests. The first thing you will notice when starting the game is the dialogue style is a lot more lighthearted and quirky compared to the typical 90s Squaresoft game. The game knows when to get serious, but a lot of times it taps on comedic writing, most which comes from Musashi's reactions. He has a lot of tude and a no-nonsense rude personality that gets expressed by the conversations with the NPCs. It's almost refreshing compared to your average RPG protagonist. Yeah, no prop. And the secret? Well, it's about the legendary armor. Legendary armor? So it's not about the five scrolls? You mean I came here for nothing? What a waste of time. See ya. He also has the tendency to talk to himself and verbally remind himself what he wants to do next. It's locked. Smash it with Lumina! Maybe I should use the key. Well, what are you gonna do? Kid's weird. There is a huge amount of voice acting in the game. Almost every NPC, no matter how minor, has at least a few voice lines. But we'll talk more about the voice performance in the audio section. What I can tell you now is there is a lot of dialogue to read if you're interested in it. Everyone in the village hub has a new dialogue each time you make some story progress. They always have something to say about the latest events or rumors. They also keep track of how long you haven't talked to them. Thank God you're alive, young man! It really makes Grilling Village feel like a living and breathing little community. Okay, we need to talk about the locations and character names. A lot of the names in Alucanid have something to do with meat-based food or vocabulary related to edibles in general. Grilling Village, Princess Filet, Weaver Dinareta, Ribson, Shepherd Bifalo, you get the picture. So the sorry, Third Squencher Empire, however, uses a naming convention that goes with soft drink or soda themed names. Soda Fountain, Colonel Capricola, Bubbles, Ginger Ale, and so forth. It's really ridiculous if you pay attention to the names and the puns in them, and that only adds to the quirky nature of the game setting. In spite of all the quirk and humor, the presentation of the story can still get pretty exciting at times and tense in others. It doesn't get overbearing. It's admittedly not the most original story out there with a lot of cliché, but the very casual, modern, straight-to-the-point dialogue, along with the quick pace of story events, should keep your attention and interest. Well, I say quick pace, but the game's pace isn't perfect. There are a few points in the story where you're asked to do some obnoxious chore that forces a lot of backtracking, or you're asked to rescue specific castle employees in order to progress. There are some very minor rough edges here and there in a couple jokes that don't land these days, and a certain NPC that you don't talk with much that gets extremely um, inappropriate with Musashi. But overall, I think the writing aged incredibly well, making this a very timeless adventure. As for Kojiro, who I mentioned earlier in the video, he doesn't get introduced until the second half of the game and he gets barely any screen presence. Both his rivalry and his duel with Musashi are direct references from the stories of the real Musashi and Kojiro, but it all gets resolved so quickly it's really disappointing. Speaking of which, this is a problem that you have the main antagonist too. They get full introduction, voice dialogue, unique designs and even unique weapons. One of them is directly responsible for two major story arcs, but long before the climax, both of them just disappear from the plot with no explanation. I don't want to spoil who they are, so the footage you're seeing doesn't have anything to do with what I'm saying. Anyway, if you have some sense of humor and you're good with very cartoonishly lighthearted stories and a ton of whimsical characters with very ridiculous names, you're really going to like the writing Brave Fencer Musashi. What was that? An earthquake? Earth scroll has been absorbed. What the, the the sword? Lumina talks? I am not talking. Telepathic communication. This is creepy. Shoot! Why do I have to do this? What the heck? I'll get Lumina, and then I'm out of here! Brave 
Brave Fencer Musashi is classified as an action RPG. That's cool, but I'm a contrarian, so I prefer to call it adventure RPG. Combat is in real time, and use two buttons for attacking. Square for quick but very short ranged attacks with the Sword Fusion, and Triangle for a single powerful and heavier attack with Lumina. Fusion can be matched for up to a 4 hit combo. If you rescue soldiers and knights, you unlock different combo moves you can do with both swords, but the combos are not necessary to complete the game. Both swords level up separately the more you use them, increasing their damage. Killing enemies with either sword increases experience for your body level as well, which adds even more to Musashi's attack damage. The melee combat is pretty basic by today's standards, you will notice fusion has a very short range that you gotta get used to. This range can make you vulnerable to certain enemy attacks since Musashi takes damage from touching enemies. On the plus side, you can hit multiple enemies at once, and the last hit in your combo always knocks enemies back. Fusion can also be charged then thrown at enemies to copy their abilities, Kirby style. This is done holding the R1 to fill your ability gauge, then pressing square. Not every type of enemy has useful abilities, but it's always fun to discover new ones and pick whichever ability works best for you. Sometimes the game expects you to use specific abilities to solve a problem, but the enemies you need are always close by. Using those abilities costs BP, which can be restored by collecting green orbs dropped by enemies or found all over the areas outside the village hub. The same gauge used for Fusion's Assimilate ability can be used for a spin attack with Lumina if you press triangle instead of a square after charging. Once you start unlocking Elemental Scrolls, you can change the ability to one of the scrolls in the pause menu and activate it the same way. Unfortunately, there is no quicker way of changing between scrolls. The scrolls can be used in combat, but they are supposed to be handled like you do with items in the Legend of Zelda series. They are usually not efficient for damage unless you use them for boss fights were designed for, solving puzzles or reaching locations you couldn't reach without them. Some of them are very underutilized, and their uselessness in combat feels like a big wasted opportunity, but at least they allow for more variety of puzzles and obstacles. If you press select, the charge ability changes to sleep. You can then charge to have Musashi just drop down to the floor and sleep, I guess. There is a point to this and I'll get to that in a minute. The game came in time to be compatible with a DualShock, so it's perfectly playable with an analog stick for moving. However, the camera can only be controlled using the L2 and R2 buttons. It doesn't matter too much since Greenland Village is the only location in the entire game where you can rotate the camera. Musashi doesn't move very fast, but it still has a bit of a starting momentum. This affects the distance of your jumps, just like in platformers, and in this game you do a lot of platforming. In fact, practically one third of the game involves platforming through narrow pathways with a side camera view. The platforming can get rough. A lot of first time players end up needing some time to get comfortable with Musashi's jump distance. Thankfully, you unlock a double jump that makes the platforming much easier, and falling to lava, hazards, or bottomless pits doesn't instantly kill you. Aside from that, I think this game handles platforming better than most early 3D console games. The camera angle is usually close to a top-down view, side view, or with an isometric angle. These perspectives help a lot with the sense of that, which can be a problem in other games. There is one exception in this game, though. And when you experience it, you will quickly see why flat back view angles can be really bad for platforming. The platforming is mostly reserved for dungeons, so don't worry, you'll still spend a lot of time just running around. And you might want to run around at all if you like leveling up, because Musashi's mind stat, which affects his defense, increases through travel distance. As expected from RPGs, you can talk to people to read what they have to say and enter shops to buy items. You can also buy action figures to admire or play with in your private room in the castle if you want. They feature detailed models of enemies and characters from the game. You can even choose to keep them in the box if you want to preserve the collection value. There is also an antique shop which is more like a pawn shop. You take any treasure you find to be appraised and sold in it. In this game, you don't buy equipment, but you do need restorative items, especially anything that is considered food, since Musashi needs to eat and rest. Musashi's BP will slowly decrease over time due to hunger. You can use food to satiate him. You should never stock on too much food though, because every food item expires. Cheese is the only exception, since it actually gets better with age. I wouldn't worry too much about this. The game gives you BP recovery orbs very often, and anytime you rescue someone from being Sheffield, not only does your max BP increase by 5, but you also recover all of it. 
You can tell there's a bean of fuel nearby by the flashing of Lumina's ability icon in the bottom left of the screen. Musashi also has a tiredness meter, which might really piss some of you off because if his tiredness gets too high, he's not able to run at full speed. Get it even higher and he can barely attack with his short sword at all. You have three options for dealing with this. Sleeping bad, which you can do in a village inn or in your private bedroom in the palace. Stock on mint from the grocery, which wakes Musashi up by 50%. Or press that one to toggle your R1 button action to sleep. This will make Musashi sleep right on the floor and cause time to pass at high speed, but will never decrease his tiredness to lower than 20% and makes him lose BP faster. I've played this game so many times that this tiredness mechanic became no more than just another part of the experience for me. But when I think about introducing this game to others, it really isn't a particularly interesting feature. Sleeping on the ground is helpful to make time pass when you're waiting for certain houses to open or trigger events that only happen at certain times of the day without going back all the way to a bed, but the tiredness meter itself doesn't add anything of value to the gameplay. All it does is force you to exit dungeons or stop in your tracks to waste time waiting for the percentage to slowly deplete while Musashi sleeps in the cold floor like a drunk old man. Again, this doesn't bother me personally at this point, but I have to be honest and tell you like it is. In addition to the Bincho fields I mentioned, you get some extra character progression from leveling up each of Musashi's 4 stats, finding up to 13 longevity berries hidden around the kingdom, and finding pieces of Musashi's legendary armor. There are also a few extra rewards you get for rescuing certain palace workers, like gloves that increase your critical hit chance and a power upgrade for fusion. Leveling up Musashi's stats comes with a limit level that gets increased each time you defeat a Crest Guardian, who are the story chapter bosses. The game gives you some kind of title based on the average of the four stats. This doesn't serve any practical purpose, but it's still cool to see you go from Little Tori to something like talked about. You can grind levels if you want, which I always do because I just like grinding in video games. It doesn't take long to reach the limit, but it's completely unnecessary. The damage increase you get from higher Lumina fusion body levels doesn't affect how much damage Crest Guardians take from Lumina, and the damage you deal with legendary scrolls is always the same. There are only a handful of bosses that don't take fixed damage. Assimilate abilities are not affected by your stats either. Personally, I'm fine with all of this, and it gives players more flexibility to take care of enemies without making them feel like they have to grind levels. Longevity berries are this game's equivalent to Zelda's heart containers. Each one increases Musashi's max HP by 25 points. To get one, you need to find a creature called Minku, which sleeps underground until it's late at night. A Minku's spawn point can be identified by this pink ball thingy. If you try to wait until it's 10 pm to grab the Minku, remember to walk away and back again. They will not spawn if you stand right next to them. Most locations are places you run into without trying. It's a matter of noting them down and returning when you have the right scroll to get to them. A few can be very obscure to find, so you might want to use a guide. Finally, the pieces of legendary armor give Musashi more permanent abilities, much like you unlock in a Metroid game. You unlock abilities like double jump, wall climbing, and being able to apprise treasures without going back to the antique store. According to the rules of the universe and laws of physics, that means we're actually forced to call this game a 3D Metroidvania. Sorry, you're not allowed to call it anything else. Movement might feel a little stiff compared to a game like Zelda, but the level design is built around this for the most part. With game overs being extremely forgiving, the game is overall not super challenging and doesn't take long to beat. In my experience of witnessing it, people who don't game a lot find some challenge here but usually end up getting comfortable enough to reach the end, even though this is a very old game at this point. I think that speaks for the timelessness and accessibility of its gameplay. The most poorly aged part of the game has to do with two story points in a couple chapters that can be extremely obscure to figure out if you don't have the habit of talking to every single NPC and rescue everyone you can find from Binsha Fields. We have a lot of walkthroughs online these days, so you can always be a spoiled lazy brat about it and look up online.
Believe it or not, the graphics were praised as some of the best in the system back in 98. They can be hard to look at now, because you can never really see a lot of the typical PS1 texture warping before your eyes, visible sheens and model parts that seem to just float in the air on some occasions. I grew up playing Nintendo 64 and PlayStation games, so the technical limitations and weirdness just get a few chuckles out of me and nothing more. This goes for any early 3D game in my opinion, but if you play them long enough, you end up not caring about how quote unquote ugly things look anymore. In case of Brave Fencer Musashi, the visuals might not look as bad as some other PlayStation games like Final Fantasy VIII or Metal Gear Solid, because the art direction for the characters follows a super deformed anime style. The models themselves are similar to the style used in the original Final Fantasy VII field models, but dare I say, better looking and more fitting by comparison. Environments are always very colorful, even when you're traveling through locations like underground tunnels and frozen castles. The soundtrack is just outstanding. When I did some research for this video, I was very surprised to find out this was the composer's first work with Square, and his past work was not even remotely similar to this style of music. He worked on games such as Konami's Time Doom Adventures and Metal Gear 2 Side Snake prior to this. There is a lot of variety in styles of music. Some of it emulates epic orchestral scores, others sound close to relaxing acoustic themes, and others play like energetic 90s trance music. Some can be more repetitive than others, but this is definitely the type of soundtrack that can still sound good even if you listen to it without having ever played the game itself. What is very consistent regardless of what genre the composer Sekto Tsuyoshi chooses to cover is the use of light motif. For his first time, he did a fantastic job. The main motifs are very present in nearly every track of the game, but the atmosphere they provide and instrumentation are dramatically different. Here are a few examples. Voice acting is one of the most impressive features of this game. It wasn't the first game to have extensive voice acting, but for every Star Fox 64 or a Is Book 1 and 2, there were dozens and dozens of really embarrassing dubs in games through the 90s. 
The performance is not always perfect, but I can overlook the few bad deliveries since 90% of the time the actors and actresses do a very good job. And not to discredit the voice actors themselves, but usually when a game's voice performance ends up this good, it means they had a voice director who knew what they were doing. Most of the time they sound natural when they're supposed to, and cartoony when they should sound cartoony. Ah, shucks! Shut up, you dumb gal! Or else y'all gonna get a licking! They really help put the necessary punch and emotion to make the many memorable lines in this game land perfectly. You will find a few well-known actors and actress names in the credits. Mona Marshall voices Musashi and she was absolutely perfect for the job. I usually put this above and beyond the vast majority of voice works in games that came out since. It's rare to find a game where effort is put into the performance for even the least important of characters. Everyone sounds like they were having fun, and with the sheer amount of voice act and dialogue carrying the story, you're likely to never get bored of watching and listening. By the way, for whatever reason you choose to play this in Japanese, Musashi happens to be voiced by none other than Rika Matsumoto, well known for her 20 plus years voicing a character called Satoshi from a little long running anime called Pocket Monsters. The sound effects in general are also excellent. The game doesn't miss the mark with audio cues you're supposed to pay attention to, like the level up sound or any time you pick something up from the ground. Musashi's taps can get a bit annoying since they're more intrusive than they should be, but he's always wearing sandals and as someone who lives in a country where everyone loves to wear sandals, they do be kinda loud so this is on point. The only real flaw I have to point out is the sound you hear when hitting enemies with Luminar Fusion. Does this really sound like someone being struck by a sharp blade? It sounds more like I'm slapping someone with a paper fan. So why did I think this game deserved a full reveal? Because in spite of all its flaws, I think it accomplished most of what it set out to do, and it also happens to be one of my favorite games of all time. With this being a 3D game that's more than 20 years old, you might find some jankiness here and there. It can be too easy at times, and you can finish in 2 or 3 play sessions if you know what you're doing. But I don't care. I think this is one of the best games not directly tied to the Final Fantasy brand that Square has released in all these decades that have been around. It has some of the comfy 90s anime adventure vibe I brought up in my Mega Man Legends mini review. But I think its humor and character lines go way beyond just that, so even if you're not into anime, I guarantee you will absolutely appreciate the dialogue as your reward for making progress in the game. There still isn't any game quite like Brave Fencer Musashi. Even its spiritual sequel, Musashi Samurai Legend, didn't quite capture the tone or design structure. I don't know what the hold up is. If you made it this far, thank you. Now you're aware of this game and hopefully you join the chorus of Brave Fence and Musashi fans demanding Square Enix brings it back in form of a re-release or some kind of remaster. Until then, you're on your own to figure out how to play this game. If you really want to play the disc on your PlayStation, good freaking luck. Especially if you want an American copy. So, do I recommend this game? Come on, do I really need to answer that question? As always, thanks for watching and take care.